Good morning. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. We are in Houston, Texas, and we are a bunch of Christians who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures verse by verse because the Bible says precept upon precept, line upon line, a little here, a little there. And since we've been studying it, we've been having a wonderful time with the Spirit of God. We're about to begin the book of uh, Colossians, the epistle that Paul wrote to the uh, the church in Colossae, and it's it's in in some ways it's similar to the book of the epistle to the Ephesians. We're going to learn some more truths about who we are in Christ and what we have and who we are, and that is the main focus of this ministry. For the people of God to find out who they are in Christ and be able to stand in the authority and in the position that God has put us in. The church is supposed to govern the world. That's the truth. In the book of Isaiah, I'm thinking chapter 11, I may be wrong. Don, please help me. It says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And in the human anatomy, there are two main divisions. You talk about the head and you talk about the body. And if the Bible says the government is upon his shoulders, the shoulder in the human anatomy is in the body. That the government of this world should be upon the shoulders of the church. But we have abdicated our positions of authority. We have distanced ourselves from the very uh, tool that he gave to us to govern the world. He said a parable about a man who had three servants, gave one five talents, gave one two talents, gave one one talent. And he said to them, occupy till I come. That word occupy in the Greek means do business. Do business till I come. And the one with five talents went out, doubled it. The one with two talents went out, doubled it. The unprofitable servant took the one talent and buried it. And sadly, that's what the church has done. Very things that we needed to be able to govern this earth. We neglected to do it and we neglected to learn about it. That's the focus of this fellowship so that we can begin to stand in our God-given authority and rebuke and re re refuse the plans and the machinations of the enemy. Praise God. What I shared with you, I said, <clears throat> sometimes one of the strategies of war is to injure and not to kill. Because if you kill, that's the end. That person is dead. You keep fighting, but if you injure, then I'm distracted or you're distracted because you have to carry me to safety. You can't leave me there. And that's what the enemy has done to the church. He's kept us just that much damaged, just that much preoccupied with stuff, just that much preoccupied with the things that divide us. And so we're not as, as effective as we ought to be. It is my prayer that the Lord will find IBBC, IBBF, a place where he will be pleased not just to dwell in, but to work through. He's coming back for a church that's without blemish, without spot, and without wrinkle. And that's what we are. That's what we will remain until he comes for us. Colossians was written by Apostle Paul. He identifies that by, by saying it. Uh, he's the one who uh, wrote it. And uh, he, like I said, in a lot of ways, it's similar to the book of Ephesians. We're going to find out a lot of things in it that re reinforces uh, the knowledge of who we are. The major thing that <clears throat> Paul dealt with is the legality of, the, of Judaism that was still bothering the church and a few people were still insisting on stuff. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Chapter one, Paul, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth, forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, a dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Mark that in your Bible. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Mark that. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the, of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of all the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. You can see that in a lot of ways, it's similar to the uh, epistle to the church in Ephesus. And we're going to do the same thing we did when we studied the book of Ephesians. We're going to mark all the things where it says, in him, through whom, by whom, with him, of whom, so that you will know the things that are yours and you will stop living like an ordinary human being, because you're not an ordinary human being. Your spirit 
created in the image and likeness of God, empowered by God with self same things with which he creates. You live in a body that is dead and decaying and therefore cannot tell you what to do. You have a soul that you must subject to his authority because that's where the battleground is. Our struggle is not with flesh and blood. It's with the spirit realm. And so we cannot hope to attain any victory in the spirit if we're trying to fight in the flesh. All right? Clearly, Paul is the apostle and he's the one who wrote this book. He wrote it to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, uh, which corrects the thing that the Catholic Church is teaching. It's not any man that sits in council and decides that somebody is a saint because of the deeds or the works. It's not by works of righteousness, but by his grace. And so all of you that have seen this and seen that, and you have all kinds of images in your home, because of your Catholic background, you need to remove those things from your house. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not make unto thyself, the fourth one, any graven image. Not of the likeness of any things in heaven above or on the earth or below the earth beneath. I don't know how the Catholic Church justifies all the graven images that are in their churches. It is clearly against the word of God. And there is no excuse for it. All right? We are saints. We're saints not because of anything we've done. We have not earned, cannot earn, earn it. We're saints because the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed to us. Just as the guilt of Adam was imputed to us. Romans chapter 5. Go and study it again. Look for the tape. Or the recording, I should say. We don't use tapes anymore. I just did it myself right then. Look for the recording and go and listen to it again. Right? We're righteous because the righteousness of Christ was imputed to us. So he starts out by giving thanks to God and telling them that he prays for them always. And I've told you there's no way God will commit a work into your hands and you will not pray daily for that work. And praying daily for this work means praying for you because you are the work. Paul says that the very last verse there, he says, uh, verse 28, one in every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. Why? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Somewhere else he says, I am striving to present you as a chaste virgin to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the goal in this fellowship, to be like him. To know him. All right. Since we've been praying for you. We've heard about your faith and your love. For all the saints. And the hope which is laid up for us in heaven. Which is what we are, are striving to inherit. Eternal life. All right. They learned from Epaphras. Who is a fellow servant. And a faithful minister of Christ. Who brought word from the church in Colossae. To Paul. For which Paul was pleased. Paul says for this cause. Since the day Epaphras brought, brought word. He did not cease to pray for them. And to desire. These are the things you want to mark in your Bible. This is the third Pauline prayer. Which is the word of God. The most effective way to pray the word of God. Is to pray the word of God back to him. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of his word will go unfulfilled. So guess what? If my prayer is his word, then my prayer will be answered because he will fulfill his word. Roman, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 23 is the first Pauline prayer that we talked about. Then we found another one in, in Philippians chapter 1. But this one is very similar to the one in Ephesians 1.17. Pray for yourself that you might be filled with knowledge. The knowledge of his will. You've got to know God's will for your life. So that you can walk in the light of his will for your life. People often are, are bothered about whether they're in his will or not. 
listen, if you're not a recalcitrant, disobedient child of God, you are in his will. You are. You cannot not be in his will. The day you got born again, you step into his perfect will for your life. What you then need to do is to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And make sure that you follow the dictates of scriptures and what God has called us to do or not to do. So personalize this prayer. Write it out on a note card. Memorize it. That's even better. But put it on a note card and pray it over your life. That Father, I thank you that I'm filled with the knowledge of your will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I understand scriptures. I understand your will. I have your wisdom. First Corinthians 131, I think it is. It says, Jesus Christ is made unto you wisdom and righteousness. You already have the wisdom of God. Just are not walking in it. You need to find out God's mind on any given issue in your life. And begin to do what the word says. That's how you gain wisdom in that area of your life. If you're a wife and you're not doing what the word says. To be a good wife, you will have problems. If you're a husband and you're not doing what the word says, to be a good husband, you will have problems. If you're a child of God and you're not doing what God says to, says to do as a child of God, you will have problems. I've told you, we really, really do not have any problem per se. What we have is a wisdom problem. Because once you know what God has to say about any one given situation, that problem will disappear. Right? I pray for myself that I am filled with the knowledge of your will, O oh God. I am filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and I walk worthy of you, O oh God, unto all pleasing. I only do the things that please you, my Father. Those are the prayers you want to pray. You cannot pray like that and still continue to be stupid. It's impossible. Because the word of God is capable of changing you. All right. Thank you, Lord, that I'm strengthened with all might according to your glorious power. If you pray that over yourself every day, when sin comes, you will have power to overcome sin. And when I talk about sin, I'm not just talking about sexual sin. I'm talking about every sin. My struggle is with anger. But I have taught myself how to choose to be angry. I worked on it for many, many years. The Bible allows me to be angry. It's not a sin. Until I start to do what I ought to do, that's when it becomes a sin. Ephesians 4.26, it says, be angry, but sin not. Do not let the wrath go, uh, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. I get angry at injustice. I get angry at lies. And if I was to react based on anger, I'd be in jail. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I'm strengthened with all might according to your glorious power, and I am patient. And I'm long-suffering. And I'm joyful in the process of being patient and long-suffering. That doesn't mean when that individual takes advantage of me, I don't get angry. But I go to God. Every time I think about it and anger wells up in me, I go to God. Giving thanks unto the Father who has qualified me to be a partaker of the inheritance of, sin, of the saints of God in light. Personalize those prayers and speak them over your life. It will change you. All right. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us in, into the kingdom of his dear son. The day you got born again, that's what God did. He took you out of the kingdom of darkness and he transferred you into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. That's why Apostle Paul tells us, he says, walk as children of the light.
Jesus said people don't want to do right and so they walk in darkness. But if you walk in light, you're forced to do right because everybody's seeing you. Don't go where you're not supposed to go. Don't hang out with people you're not supposed to hang out with. I don't care who it is. Scripture says evil company corrupts good character. My famous example, if I stand on a table and you're standing on the floor, which is easier for me? Which is easier for me to pull you up onto the table or for you to pull me down to the floor? Obviously, it's easier for you to pull me down than for me to pull you up. He has delivered you. Notice the past tenseness of the word of God in this book as well. Because that's how the book of Ephesians is. Everything is in the, in fact, double past tense. He hath delivered. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In whom we have redemption through his blood. You need to circle that. You have been redeemed. It's not about to do it. It's done already. And you must walk in the light of the redemption that you have. And quit going back to the beggarly elements of your former life. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And if you understand that it's by grace that you're forgiven, then you don't take that grace for granted. Grace doesn't cover me when I sin. Grace empowers me not to sin. Get it clear. Grace is not given so that when I sin, I run to his grace. Grace gives me the power, understanding that I don't deserve the grace that I have from him. Gives me the power to say, no, I'm not going to do that to the Lord who hung on the cross for me. I walk away. If you believe in your head that, well, I'm, I'm flesh and blood, you will continue to sin. Because you're not flesh and blood, you're spirit. You just live inside an earth suit because you need this suit to operate here. Just like if you were to go to space, you would have to put on a space suit to be able to operate in space. That's why the day I remove this cloak, it's going to drop to the ground. Unable to see, unable to talk, unable to hear, unable to walk, unable to do anything. Because the real me, my spirit man, is what animates it. And is what makes it walk, talk, laugh, play, and all the rest of it. Once I come out of it, my kids will pick it up and bury it. It's useless. It's only good for me to be able to operate here on earth. He put five physical senses there so that I can see, taste, touch, hear, and, and what's the last one? Smell. So he doesn't tell me what to do. I tell it what to do. And then he begins to tell us who Christ is. He says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. All right, when, when the word firstborn is used for Christ, people have a tendency to think that he was, he was born just like I was married and I, I had Ariane as my firstborn. It's not the same thing. That title firstborn is descriptive of the power and the authority that he has. Okay, spirits... Don't have sex. It's a physical body that has that physiological need. Okay? So it's not like God had sex and then boy is son. No. There is one God expressed in three persons. And I've taught that. 
It's all over nature. Water can be liquid, it can be solid, it can be gas. Like the light from the sun, radiation from the sun, heat from the sun. It's the same one sun. I'm somebody's mother, I'm somebody's sister, I'm somebody's cousin. It's the same one me. All right? Is the image of the invisible God because before time, the Godhead got together and decided that Jesus Christ was going to come and die because through the attribute of foreknowledge, they knew they were going to create man. They knew man was going to fall and they knew man was going to need a savior. That's why in the book of Revelation chapter four, the Bible says the lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the earth. Through the function of foreknowledge, the triune God had gotten together in the heavenlies and they had decided that at time T, when Adam has messed up and man has fallen, son, you're going to have to go and become human so that you can redeem them back to their rightful place. That's why the Bible can tell us that he was slain before the foundations of the earth. It was a done deal. God was just waiting for time for him to be born of the virgin and for him to grow and for him to do the work of redemption on the cross of Calvary. By him were all things created. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. He created, which means he made certain things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 starts with a conjunction. And the earth became without form and void. And darkness covered the face of the deep. Something cataclysmic happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. If God created in Genesis 1-1, how come in verse 2, darkness was, not, was now all over it? When in God, there is no darkness, it's all light. Something happened. How can darkness cover the face of the deep? And it was without form and void, shapeless and empty. When in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that he created. Something happened, and I've taught that. Jay, please look for that teaching and put it on our Telegram chat so that they can go back and listen to it. Revelation 12, 4. Satan went about canvassing in heaven, persuaded a third of the angels to join him in insurrection against God. Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. And the dragon and his angels fought. He was kicked out of heaven and his place was not found anymore. Jesus Christ said in Luke 10, 18, I beheld Satan, Luke 18, 10, I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When he fell, he came and messed the earth that God created up. He messed it up. We don't know what that first creation is like. But we know there was a pre-Adamic creation. Because the Bible says when he fell, he weakened the nations. We find those scriptures in Ezekiel. I think it's 28. And Isaiah 14.12. Now listen to the teaching so you can understand. By him were all things created. In verse 3 of Genesis 1, after that cataclysmic event had happened and the earth became without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep, God said in verse 3, let there be light, singular. John chapter 1, it says, in him was light, and that light was the life of men. So when God said in Genesis 1, 3, let there be light, he's, he was saying to Jesus, light, make yourself manifest. Because he did not create the heavenly lights, the moon, the sun, and all the heavenly bodies until verse 14. It's corroborated here again by telling us that by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. He already told us about those ones 
in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness, against wicked spirits in the heavenlies. He's already told us that those things exist in the second heaven. Paul lets us know that there are three heavens. There's the one immediately above the earth that you and I see. There's the one where Satan set up shop. And there's the one where God dwells. It tells us in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, that he was taken up to heaven. And the things to the third heaven, the things that he saw, it's unlawful for him to come back and tell us. So we know that there are three heavens. And Satan has set up shop in the heavens. That's why you cannot operate from the earth. You've got to operate where you are seated. You are seated in the heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. If you're trying to operate from this mundane level, you will fail 100 times out of 100 times. You've got to operate from where you are positionally seated. It's unfortunate that America doesn't have monarchy. So you guys are not familiar with this, this concept. If you walk into a palace, the king sits on his throne. But when it's time to decide on a matter, he climbs higher and he sits on a higher throne. There's one that he sits on to receive people as they come to the palace to visit or pay homage or whatever. When it comes to ruling over a matter, he climbs up and sits on a higher throne. And you're seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. What are you doing on this level? Dealing with nonsense. When you should be operating from where he put you, speaking and decreeing. He said, thou shalt decree a thing. And it shall be established unto you. It's in the book of Job. I'm thinking 28. It says, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. Yet we're struggling with stupid things. Struggling with bills. Struggling with... with with a boss on the job, struggling with lack. I told you it's only your job that God can use to prosper you. God reserves the right to bless you any which way that He wants. He knows your name, He knows your address. He can speak to His son in China, give him your address, and tell him, Do this. Don't limit God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In him, by him, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's why they are subject to him. And you are in him. So all of those things are subject to you. These are new creation realities. First Corinthians 5.17. If any man being Christ is a new creature. Google says new means never before existed. Because the old man died. He's a new creature. All things have passed away. And everything has become new. But you go back all the time and you wake up that dead man. He is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church. How can the head be as powerful as he is? And the church is a mess. How?
is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That's why we have paradise. That was the holding tank where every Old Testament saint went to because he had to be the firstborn from the dead to take his blood up as propitiation for our sins. That's why when Mary wanted to hug him after she saw him at the tomb, he said, don't touch me because I've not gone up to your father and to my father. He had to take his blood to present at the mercy seat in heaven. Everything in the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of the truth of the New Testament. And so when he told them to build the Ark of the Covenant and put two uh, uh, angels on it whose wings touch the direct space on top of the Ark where the angels' wings touch is the mercy seat. And in the Old Testament, after the lamb that the worshiper brought in the, uh, in the outer court, the Old Testament, uh, tabernacle had three chambers the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. The worshiper will come with one unblemished lamb. It had to be an unblemished lamb because it typified Jesus Christ, who is sinless. There were two uh, furnished, funny, what should I call it? For lack of a better term, furnished furniture in the outer court. There was the brazen altar and there was the liver of water. The priest took the animal, the unblemished, unblemished animal, killed it at the brazen altar. When he was done with the sacrifice, collected the blood, he goes to the liver of water, he washes himself clean, and then he goes into the holy place where he does some other things. And then the high priest, only the high priest can go beyond the veil. There was a veil that separated the inner court from the most holy place. Only the high priest could go in. And his garment was sewn at the bottom of the skirt. They put bells. So that as long as, and then they tied a rope around his waist that came all the way out to the outer court. As long as the bells were tinkling, they knew he was okay. Because no one could enter the Holy of Holies with one sin. The high priest would have to make a sacrifice for his own sin first. So that he would be qualified to enter the most holy place to carry the blood of the worshiper, uh, the blood of the lamb that the worshiper brought. All these are types and shadows. And when we come to the book of Hebrews, you will understand. The Bible says, He's before all things, by Him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. That's why he's Lord in the air, on land, and underneath the earth. His authority is vertical. Every other kind of authority is horizontal. Once I step out of the United States, Biden can't tell me what to do. Once I step outside of Nigeria, Buhari can't tell me what to do. So Jesus' authority is vertical in heaven, on earth, and underneath the earth. That's why everything bows at the mention of the name of Jesus. The Bible says, They please the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. And you are in him. Which means you have all fullness. You don't lack anything, spiritually speaking. And you cannot continue to operate like an ordinary human being. He says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things unto himself. The reason why we have the confidence to enter into the most holy place now. That's why when he died on the cross, the Bible says the veil of the temple was split in half given access to every single one of us. We don't need a high priest anymore. He has become our high priest. Through the blood of his cross, he reconciled all things unto himself by Jesus. Whether they're things on earth or things in heaven. 
And we who were alienated because of sin and enemies in our mind. That's where the battle is, the mind, your thought life. You've got to take control of your thought life. Like I said yesterday, I cannot stop a bird from flying over my head, but I can stop it from building a nest on my head. I can't stop thoughts from coming. The thoughts will come, but what I do with it is what matters. Do I reject it and cast it out immediately, or do I take it and I begin to toy with it? Because that's how it starts. When you begin to think on it and toy with it, you will create a plan. And you will execute the plan. The Bible says flee. The word flee means run away as if in terror. Go and look at your dictionary. Flee all appearance of evil. Please put that scripture up for me, Don. God is not telling you to check whether it is evil or not. He says if it, if it looks like it, run. Flee all appearance of evil. We who were sometimes alienated and enemies in our mind because of our wicked works, he has reconciled us to himself. By crucifying the body of flesh. He was a 33-year-old man before he died. You think he didn't have Sexual thoughts. Any grown 33 year old man. Will have such thoughts. The Bible says he was tempted like us. On all fronts. Yet he was without sin. It's possible. It just depends on how much you love him. It depends on how much you want to live for him. Put that other scripture up. Before someone goes to say, Pastor Mo blasphemed, he said Jesus has sexual thoughts. Of course he was a man. 100% man. And 100% God. He wasn't half man, half God. He reconciled everything to himself in the body of his flesh through death. He killed the flesh. So that he can present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Jesus Christ said, the prince of this world cometh, he finds nothing in me. That's the cry of my heart. Satan will never find a hook. He will never find a space in my life to put a foot. Because from a foothold, he will build a stronghold. That's 21 and 22. Has a clause attached to it, 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. That's what I mean by damaged goods. I am so settled. Put a gun to my head. I will tell you to shoot. Because to live is Christ. To die is gain. We used to sing a song when we first got saved. Back in the 70s. I have decided. To follow Jesus. I have decided. To follow Jesus. I have decided. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. If no one joins me, still I will follow. If no one joins me, still I will follow. If no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. 
The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. If you sing that in church every day, tell me how will you go out and sing? I need to sit down. As I remember these songs, I will compile them and I'll begin to introduce them at IBBC. We sang scriptures. It wasn't what I feel about him or what he feels about me, what he did for me. And that, that was what we sang about. We sang the word. Pastors make the mistake when they see talent. They put them on the altar. It's called burning strange fires before the altar of God. Please look for that scripture and put it up for me. Talent is not a calling. And talent is not the anointing. You don't prove them. You don't try them. They don't sit under your tutelage. Just because they can draw. And they can play the keyboard. They're in your music department. We will clap and I will manage with my four fingers until God sends us people who understand what it is to be worship leaders. You handle the word, and I know I'm deviating. You handle the word, you just handle it in music. Your life should be just as, as holy as the pastor's. People will close from a club or close from a session and come on Sunday morning to come and play. It's not for nothing that we don't see the demonstration of his power anymore. We burn strange fires before the altar. The Bible says in verse 23, it's conditional if you continue. The body will remain crucified. Jesus will be able to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, if you're grounded and you're settled, and you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. No one can tell me different. Put a gun to my head. Shoot. I know where I'm going. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering. All of my afflictions in my body and all the rest of it is well worth it. I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. I was complaining one day to God. Because my contemporaries in ministry, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, 30 years ago, they sit over congregations in the thousands. God said, I kept you for such a time as this. That's exactly what he said to me a few weeks ago in my living room here. That's the day he told me that I will make you the repairer of the breach. I wish I had written the date down. But I know it was December last year. Because what people he called me to, and I know there are people older than 35 here, and I appreciate you for, for coming. Together we will affect that generation because they don't know any better, 35 and under. What they grew, grew up seeing as church is not the church of Jesus Christ. I grew up seeing miracles. 11 people raised from the dead in the ministry of my father and the Lord. 11. I've seen people get out of wheelchair. I've seen deaf ears unstopped. 
I've seen the glory cloud. Camp meeting 1982, Kenneth Hagin Ministries. It came in there. It was in that corner. I was sitting in the beaches to the left. This was the, 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 the platform. It's not what they do in church now. Whip, whip. I know he's starting little fires all over the place. What we're doing is not unique. It's not only us. God never does that. He's starting little, little fires like this all over the place. And he will fan it until all of us connect and then will become a blazing, raging fire that will purify the church for him to be able to come back. We're the one delaying his return. I have not seen any groom that is not eager to be joined to his bride. I haven't seen one. If there's traffic, if he has to jog to church to be on time, he will get out of the car and jog. Why wouldn't Jesus want to be joined to his bride, the church? But the ones that are not ready. Be settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, verse 23. And which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, where Paul is made a minister. Paul says, I rejoice in all of my sufferings, because I made a minister according to this present dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from the generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. It was when we were studying Romans that the, the, the revelation came to me. That before God struck a special relationship with the Jewish people, he had us Gentiles in mind. We had a relationship with him before the Jews. Because Abraham was a Gentile. And he made his covenant with him and he, tell, he told him, he said, in you all nations will be blessed. It's just that he chose to have a special covenant with Jacob, with Israel. That's why we can say Abraham's blessings are ours. According to Galatians 3. The mystery which had been hid from the ages was the fact that he was going to reconcile both. And we saw that when we were studying Ephesians. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The riches of the glory of God inside of you remains a mystery. You carry his glory. You carry his presence. You show up, God shows up. He lives on the inside of you. We need to get to the place where we understand that there are no limitations. Only the ones we entertain. He said, ask and you'll receive. There are no hoops to jump, jump through. Ask and you will receive. Luke 11, 9. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And I told you, ask a lawyer. What's the difference between shall and will? Huge difference. James throw, throws more light into that. He said, you ask. And you don't get because you ask amiss. You ask to consume it on your loss. James clarifies it further for us. Let scripture interpret scripture. Ask. 
Christ in you. As another song we used to sing back in the day. I've got the life of God in me. I've got the life of God in me. It brings me joy and, and sweet repose to my soul. Something like that. I've got the life of God in me. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're filled with praise, filled with power, filled with glory. You're filled with praise, we will power, filled with glory. You're filled with praise, we will power, filled with glory. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You sing that every Sunday and you think Monday to Friday you won't live right. Nice. Ooh, ah, and, ah. I don't know what part of worship is. Ooh, and, ah. God help us. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, so that you may be perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul is teaching so that you may be perfect in Christ Jesus. That word perfect means mature. It doesn't mean flawless. We're not flawless as long as we're dealing with this stupid thing called flesh. But you can be mature. And when you're mature, you're discerning. When you're discerning, you will choose right. Whereunto I labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. God be the glory, we see it manifest in my life. I go back and I listen to myself and I'm amazed. The grace of God for teaching in my life is jaw dropping. And to him be all the glory. I recognize that we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. That the excellency of the power may be of him. Put that scripture up for me. And you're welcome to covet it. The Bible says covet the gifts of the spirit. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are pastors. Some of you are prophets. Because everything that IBBF, IBBC needs is within the body. I don't go out to borrow somebody's eyes before I can see. And I don't go to borrow their hands before I can do what hands do. The body is complete. Everything we need is here. And one by one, God will bring out those gifts. I'm looking for a pastor and it's going to come from one of you. Because I'm pastoring by grace. I'm not a pastor, I'm a teacher. Pastoring is my secondary gift. Teaching is my primary gift. Because I cannot find expression for the teaching gift if I don't know how to gather people and pastor them. And because pastors have a secondary gift to teach, they don't give room to teachers. They invite me to their church once, they don't call me back again. <laughs> Praise God. You need to wake up, child of God. He's waiting on you. The stuff that he's deposited on the inside of you, eyes have not seen. You don't even have a clue of the investment of God in you. Questions? Why is everybody quiet? <laughs> Praise God forevermore. 
<laughs> Even the phone is quiet this morning. <laughs> Who find us had to work. She couldn't be on. She was crying. Oh, okay. <laughs> Praise God. Because she's the first with her. Her Bible is as big as. <laughs> Amen. All right. If you don't have any questions, stop too. <laughs> For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid. You need to circle that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, circle that, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principalities and power. In whom, circle it, also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Circle that verse. And you being dead in your sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened. Together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Circle together with him in that verse. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That was against us which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from whom all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if he be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye still subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Do he needed to address the legality that some people were still trying to put upon these saints in, in policy? Paul says, I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. Of course, Paul had a burden for everybody that God gave to him to, to, to groom, if you like, or to grow in the things of God. Uh, the saints at Laodicea that these ones in Colossae and Laodicea, they all may have one heart and be knit together in love with the full assurance of understanding and acknowledging the mystery whereby 
God supernaturally joins us. Okay? I've seen that in IBBF. We don't know each other, but the time, but whenever we have the opportunity to meet ourselves for the first time, it's it's like we've known each other forever. That's because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Let's put that scripture up for me. That's genuine love. It, 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 it's just there. It's not because of anything you did or anything I did. God has just knit our hearts together. So when we come together, if someone tells you that we only know each other on Zoom, it's like, no, that's not possible. That's the love of God in oppression. It's not possible to pray for someone and not love them. It's impossible. If you lift somebody up constantly before God, the love of God for them will be birthed in your heart. All right? Husbands and wives, borrow a leaf from there. Husbands especially, pray for your wives. That nonsense that they taught us that, oh, wives, you pray for your husband. I'm not saying wives should not pray for their husband, but the priestly responsibility is on the man. In most homes, you find that the woman is more mature spiritually than the man. That's why your marriage is wonky. Because you're not standing as a priest. All right. It says in whom, talking about Jesus, verse 3, I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Jesus. And Jesus lives on the inside of you. That means you have access to all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Because you have access to him. Why should anything stump you? Why should, should you ever be in a position where you don't know what to do? Paul begins to warn them because of all these legalistic requirements that they were trying to put back on the saints in Colossae. It says, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Although I'm absent from you, Yet I'm with you in spirit. I was talking to somebody yesterday. The Holy Ghost had been talking to me about them. And I put a call through to them. And when you talk about ratting someone out, the Holy Ghost ratted them out in a good way. We laughed. As I told her what the Holy Ghost had been telling her. And that was all she needed, that confirmation. And I know she's going to run with it. It's not the exclusive prison of pastors. If you spend time with the Holy Spirit, he will talk to you. If you spend time praying for someone, he will talk to you about that person. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. And Christ is in you, the hope of glory. It's impossible to fail, child of God. It is. If you remain in him, it's impossible. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. That's when it's not possible and it cannot happen. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is in him. And he's in you. Hmm. Paul says, I may be absent, but I'm with you in spirit. Always rejoicing over you. Beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He then enjoins them that as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. Scripture says, in him I live and move and have my being. That was the song when we, we used to sing back in the day too. In him I live and move 
and have my being in my lips and move and have my being. Songwriters back then wrote songs using scriptures. The only modern contemporary artist that I know that has done that is, uh, what's the name of this fellow? I listen to him all the time. The guy who wrote Victory Belongs to Jesus. Todd Delaney. A, Todd Delaney. Yeah, Todd Delaney. He has a particular album that he calls Back to the Word. And he sang the word throughout. As you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in him, rooted, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein. What is the therein? What you have been taught with thanksgiving. Do not let any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. You must tie a scarf. You must take shoes off. You cannot eat meat. You cannot eat fish. You cannot do this and you cannot do that. Not in Christ. Galatians 5.13, he's called you to liberty. But he wants that you do not abuse that liberty. He says, use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Because I'm free to do what I like. So I do anything that I like. No. Be well lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And he lives in you. I know I've said that like 50 times already. I'm going to continue to say it until it sinks into your mind that he lives in you and you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Please put that scripture up. You are complete in him. The reason why you don't know who you are is because you have not spent time to read the will. Father dies, lives a hundred million for you. And you're living in a studio apartment in some corner of the city. Until you read the will, you will not know that he's left you a hundred million. And you'll continue to live in that studio apartment. But the day the lawyers get to you and they tell you, your zip code will change. Your car will change. The clothes you wear will change. You need to know who you are in Christ. You're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. That's why in Romans chapter 8, he says, if Christ be for you, who? Who can be against you? The very breath of their nostrils is in your father's hand. They will be transferred or fired. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sin, the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. And if you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. If they sprinkled water on your head, that wasn't baptism. If they baptized you when you were an infant, that was a waste of time. Because you did not know what they were doing and you were not a part of it. Your parents did it to salvage their own conscience. 
Baptism is for someone who has one, given their lives to Christ. Because baptism is an outward testimony of the inward work of grace that he has done in your life. You are shouting to the world to say, I identify with Christ. Because when you are immersed, the Bible says you are buried with him in baptism. He didn't say you are sprinkled with him in baptism. I don't know where they got that nonsense from to be baptizing infants who don't, they don't understand what you're doing. It's like throwing a lavish first, first birthday for a, for a kid. The first birthday party is for you and the father and your friends. The child doesn't know one day different from the other. You're buried with him when you're immersed in water. And you're saying to the witnesses, I identify with him in his death and burial. And when you're pulled out of the water, you're saying, I identify with his resurrection. The Bible says the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. And he quickens your mortal body by that self, same spirit that dwells in you. I think it's Romans 8. You're not an ordinary human being. Stop living like Know who you are. Understand who you are. And begin to live. You're buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are also risen with him. Through faith of the operation of God. Who raised him from the dead. I shared my testimony. Some of you may not know it. Both my parents were Methodist ministers, ordained ministers in the Methodist church in Nigeria. Difficult to lead them to Christ. You start a scripture, they'll finish it for you. They knew the Bible, but it was head knowledge. And I kept crying to God that my parents must be saved. And when I went for baptismal classes and they told me, what baptism meant, I said to God, I said, the day I get baptized, that's the day my parents will be saved. I made up my mind that once I come out of the water, I'm not going to say a word to a soul. The first person I will speak to will be my parents. If that power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is what is in me, they must receive Christ. I got baptized in the waters at the University of Lagos. Those of you who are Nigerians, you know where the body of water is. Got in the car. My husband at that time drove. I didn't say one word to anybody. Got to my parents' home. Unfortunately, my dad was not home, but my mom was. I walked in, I greeted her, and I said, Mom, I would like for you to go and get your Bible. Now, if you're an African, you know you just died. And they're about to bury you. To tell your mom to get up and do something. Your mother. My mom got up without a word. And she went and fetched her Bible. And I walked her through scriptures. And I told her that I know you were born by a vicar. And you yourself, you are a minister. But you need to be born again. I told her, I said, when you get to heaven, you're not going to see a Methodist Jesus. You'll see a born again Jesus because he's the firstborn from the dead. My mom, without arguing, gave her life to the Lord that day. It took a while for my dad to come around, almost 12 years, but I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord as well. Baptism is not just, uh, let's, let's just, no. It's powerful if you understand it the way the Bible describes it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is what you come out of the water with when you're baptized. God is not a man that he should lie. You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, he quickened you. The word quicken is an old English word of, uh, for make alive. He made you alive. Quicken you together with him, having forgiven you all 
trespasses. That's why you're a saint. And you have to live like a saint. You can't go back to all the beggarly elements of this life. Lying and cheating and 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 emulations and strife and fornication and idolatry and all the nonsense the flesh wants. You can't go back to that. Verse 14 says, he has blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you. I was counseling with someone who was finding it difficult to get work because their background checkup always fell short. I told her, I said, the Bible says he has counseled. How many of you know God can clean your record? 100%. They will read it, they will see that it says what it says, and they will say, you know what? I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and I'll give you the job. God can do that. It's nothing he will not do for his child. Nothing. He has blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to you. He took it out of your way. By nailing it to the cross. The price is paid in full. Not only did he take those things out of your way. He then took care of those who would seek to still put those things on you. The principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness and the wicked spirits. That we deal with that tempt us on a daily basis. The Bible says he spoiled principalities. That's what happens when you go to war and you rout the enemy and you bring back spoils of the war. It paints a picture of a Roman general coming back to Rome after having conquered many places. He would tie all of the, the conquered people and everything that they got from there, all the gold, all the silver, whatever it was. He would tie it in a long triumphant procession and ride into Rome. These are historical facts. He spoiled principalities and powers. He made an open show of them. Triumphing over them in the cross. It in your Bible is referring to the cross. Triumphing over them in it. Triumphing over them in the cross. He went to war. He won the war. And he brought the spoils of war for you. Let no man therefore judge you. But all of this, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Because he has taken it out of the way. The irony of the law is if you broke one, you were guilty of all. And there were 630 of them. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us when we're studying the book of Galatians that the law is a schoolmaster. The law was given to us to show us that we cannot qualify. We can't. We break the law every day. How many of you drive according to speed limit? You've never, ever broken speed limit. Lift up your hands. We'll cast out that lying devil because we know you're lying. We break the law every day. You can't qualify. That's why you have to depend on grace. Let no man therefore judge you. In all this thou shalt not. New moon, Sabbath days, and so on and so forth. A holy day. Paul says, whoever counts it holy, to him it is holy. 
I saw one one post on Instagram. This person was saying Christianity. I should, uh, we shouldn't be practicing. We shouldn't be observing Christmas in Christianity because it was a pagan holiday back in the day, and it was this, that, and the other. I said sometimes we're so foolish. The only holiday where Jesus Christ is acknowledged worldwide, even by the unbelieving world. They are telling us not to observe it. Who says this present December 25 is the December 25 of those pagan days? A calendar is not accurate. We've all just agreed to use the Gregorian calendar. First, we were using the Julian calendar. Then they changed to the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar itself is not even accurate. Because they could not find one day. They were looking for one day. And like I always say, they should go and ask Joshua. He stopped the sun. And so they said, all right, that day that we can't account for, let's split it into quarter days. And let's have four quarter days. But let's all put it on the fourth year so that we have a leap year. And even if pagans took December 25 to, to serve their pagan gods, we, who are the sons of Almighty God, have a duty, a, a care of duty or a duty of care to take back that date from them. Their God didn't create December 25. My God did. One thing that we have in common that we can, everybody knows Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. It is a historical fact. Everybody knows he died and he rose from the dead. It's a historical fact. Paul tells us that there is shadow of the things to come. But the body is of Christ. We are of Christ. Don't let any man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, humility and worshipping of angels. Kirubu and Serafu Church. There are churches in, in Africa. Called Cherubim and Seraphim Churches. And they pray to Holy Michael. Holy Uriel. Holy Raphael. I don't know where they got the names of the angels from. There are three angels mentioned by name in scriptures. Michael the warring angel. Gabriel the minister for information. Because he's the one God would send. Go and tell the shepherds, go and tell Zachariah, go and tell Mary, go to Daniel and Lucifer, who was the son of the morning, the angel that led worship in heaven before he fell and became the adversary, Satan. People worship angels. Google it. And they have all kinds of names. Like I've told you, any angel that you invoke because you saw the name on Google, you're on your own. If God wanted us to know the names of angels, he would have told us more than the three that he told us. I don't need their names. They're sent to serve me. Hebrews 1.14 The ministering spirits sent to minister to me an heir of salvation. As mighty as they are, we call them and send them. That's what they're supposed to do. Psalm 103, I think it's verse 20. This bless the Lord, all ye his angels that excel in, in strength, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Once you speak the, the word of God, the angels move. Many of you, you have angels at your disposal. You don't even use them. You don't even remember that you have them. They follow you around because they have a mandate. Your, your guardian angel follows you around. There's one assigned at birth. Jesus said so. He said, don't mess around with these little children. Their angels do behold the face of my father in heaven. So there's one assigned to you at birth. That's where the world get, gets the word guardian angel from. Well, you are not even conscious. He just follows you around. And because you don't invoke anything and you don't command anything, he follows you around. Maybe he helps to protect you 
from accidents and things like that, but you don't actively engage them. There was a time I, when I filed for my, my uh, rather my the church where I was serving, they filed my, my papers <clears throat> at that time. And, and my husband at that time was still in Nigeria. He was stuck in Nigeria. The US embassy wouldn't give him a visa. I went to my bishop and I said, would you withdraw my application and file for him? Initially, he said, no, I don't know him, this, that, and the other. I said, well, you know me. I've been serving here. I'm talking about my husband. So they withdrew my application and they filed for him. At a point in time, that file got missing. And for months, there was nothing we could do. We kept calling and they kept saying they haven't found it. I went home. I still see myself in my bedroom in Staten Island. I went home and I dispatched an angel. God told me the file was in Vermont. I told the angel, I said, go there, go and look for it and put it on the table of the person who is supposed to work on it. And God honored that prayer. He came to this country with a green card. I'm telling you the truth. He came to this country with a green card. There's nothing God won't do. Nothing. You've got to have that kind of faith in him. We're not to worship angels. They are ministering spirits sent to minister to us, heirs of salvation. Paul says, by, by so doing, they are, intrud they, they are intruding into things that they, they don't understand. And I'm sure when they invoke these angels, demonic angels show up as angels of light. The Bible says, and no marvel, Satan can appear as an angel of light. Please put that scripture up. And so when, when they invoke the angels and something supernatural happens, they think it's God. It's not necessarily God. Any angel that is a real true angel will point you back to Jesus. In the book of Revelation, after that angel showed John the revelation, John wanted to fall on his knees to worship him. The angel says, see that you do not do it. Worship God. They are vainly popped up in their fleshly mind and they don't hold the head, who is Christ, from which all the body, by joints and bands, Having nourishment ministered, the body is ministered nourishment by Christ, who is the head. That's why we have to understand that we're one body. Offenses will come. Jesus told us that. He said offenses will come. Please put that scripture up. But woe to him by whom the offense comes. I will offend you. And you will offend me. But that's not enough reason to leave. I told you two people have left. I'm texting them and I'm calling them. They're not responding to me. It's going to come a time when I'll stop. Because the Bible says they went out from amongst us because they were never a part of us. Jesus is the one building this fellowship. If he needs to remove anybody, he, he has the right to remove them. And if I feel a need to remove someone, I will remove the person because this work will be done right. It will be done according to the word of God, not according to what I think, what I feel, or what anybody thinks, or what anybody feels. The head from whom all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together 
increase it with the increase of God. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, God added 3,000 souls. One meeting. That's God. That's the kind of increase we're looking for. God will bring people. I'm not going to get into any, any, any gimmicks. I see on the internet strategies for growth. What strategy? Can you grow anything that God has not grown? Therefore, if you are dead with him, verse 20, if you are dead with Christ and from the rudiments of the world, why are you still living in the world subject to all the do's and the don'ts of the world? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Those things are going to perish with the using. They are all after the commandments and the doctrines of men. It won't last. Paul says they have a show of wisdom in willing to worship and willing to be humble. Should be told if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you don't have to struggle to humble yourself. The Spirit of God comes with the Spirit of humility. He doesn't talk about himself. John chapter 15, he talks about Jesus. The Bible says he will not speak of himself. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So it's, it's the flesh that's making them deny the flesh. So that it can be said of them, man, that guy, he fasts. That's what that verse is telling you. A show of wisdom in will worship and humility. It's not coming by the spirit. They're willing it. Neglecting of the body. Abstinence from sex or abstinence from food. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. They're not doing it honorable. But it's because they want to satisfy the flesh. So that it can be said of them. That ah. Questions? Any comments, any thoughts? Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Tracy, hi. It's been a minute. Hello, Mom. God bless you. Happy New Year. <laughs> uh, same to you. Uh, we've got um, a crisis in South Africa with electricity. So we've got many hours, about 10 hours a day, where oh, wow. um, we don't have electricity. Yeah, so that's why you haven't seen me live. So when I do can, I do join. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year to everybody. I hope you all are great. Um, so I have a question with regards to the previous scripture that we read, um, where you spoke about coveting gifts. Um, how would you go about praying for that? Okay, let me start from the point of you identifying Mm -hmm. The call that's on your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you if you if you feel or you know that you're called to be a teacher, mm. then you start to pray to God about that particular gift. When it says covet spiritual gifts, it doesn't mean covet all, because you mm -hmm. are probably not wired to function in all. Right. 
So if, if you feel that there's a pastoral call on your life, or you feel mm. like you, you have a call for mercy and hospitality, mm. feel like you have a call uh, for the prophetic, you begin to ask God to teach you. Mm -hmm. Begin to ask God, uh, find people who already walk in that gift and align yourself with them. Mm -hmm. See, there was a guy when I was growing up in the faith that was called a walking Bible. And I desired to be like him. Mm. And today people call me a walking Bible. Mm. Okay. To align yourself with people that have the gift that you think you also have. Mm. Get books and mm. read up on it. Mm. And that's how you okay. begin to pray. And for those things that you cannot articulate, you have the gift of praying in tongues. Right. Okay. So to covet means to earnestly desire, to hunger after. Mm. See? Not to envy. Not to envy. Mm. No, it, it's old English word for earnestly desire. Mm. Not covetousness as in the same to, to covet someone's goods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right, let's bring our study to a close. Tomorrow, we're going to look at chapter three and chapter four. And that's where clearly how God expects us to order our life is laid out. So invite people, invite married people, especially, I think it's time for us to do another seminar on, on, on marriage. On, on, I don't want to say on relationship. I, I don't like that word. Because everybody's in a relationship. What is a relationship? What is a relationship? Two so people for... relating. Say again. Two people relating to each other. <laughs> in purpose of no, when, when people say they're in a relationship what they mean is that they are they are sleeping with each other they 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 are they are friends exclusive to any other male or female mm. so what we sh what should we call it then that individual is your friend until he proposes then he becomes your so fiance Okay. Are we talking only about romantic or, or male and female? I'm um, talking about male and female. Relations. Well, relationships relation. are clear. I have a relationship with my parents. They're my parents. I'm their child. I have a relationship with my children. I'm their mother. But when two people are not married, what are they? They're friends. And it should be friendship first, because when adversity comes, it's your friendship that will sustain you. That's why you don't start a relationship with sex. It beclouds your judgment. Yeah. And you're not able to tell whether this individual is for you or not. But it's in friendship that you demonstrate care. It's in friendship that you demonstrate understanding. It's in friendship that you, you, you get to learn the person. They get to learn you. Society has so evolved that it makes obeying the word of God difficult. Back in the day 18, you were married. History tells us that uh, uh, Joseph and Mary were like 14 and 18 or something like that, or 16 and 18. They were young. And you didn't have to burn.
When I talk to people, they say, I'm a 35 year old man. What do you want me to do? Obey God. That's what I want you to do. Fix your life. Get your finances together. Ask God to give you the wife He has for you. You leave yourself open and vulnerable. And you don't walk in his ways. Do you think, Pastor Mo, that's one of the reasons we are experiencing um, these, <laughs> I'll use the relationship word lightly or in commas, these issues now, is that I, we wait until we're older to get I don't married? Understand. I don't understand your question. So do you think the reason why we have all of these challenges right 